So hello everyone, I'm Vali and so, so today I'm going to be talking about um, essentially the, the, this, so, so we have this thing called the interest function and I'm going to be talking about the role of the interest function in prediction and control or reinforcement learning in general, right? Um, and and so, so, so this work has been, you know, with discussions with, uh, with, uh, with Rich and Martha. Uh, so first let's talk about the prediction problem. So in the prediction problem, you're given a policy pi, usually, and you're, you're asked to estimate you know, the state value function or the action value function, which is essentially the, the expected return that you get from a state or state action pair, right? And we usually think of it um, through, through, you know, through different objectives, and, 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 uh, and, and a common objective we try to minimize is the mean squared value error, which is essentially the squared error in, uh, in, in our, in our um, estimate of the value for each state weighted by essentially how often we visit that state or state action pair in the case of action values, right? Um, and is this actually desirable is a good question, right? Do we actually want to care about states or state action pairs, yeah? Uh, can you go back? Yeah. Uh, so in the mean square value error, why do you have both one over the, one over the size of S and also? And me, okay. Um, Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess I can remove that because you have mu. So, so mu mu is already a, you know, a distribution over state. So yes, that should I shouldn't have the mu there. You're right. Um, okay, but so if you think about the accuracy of um, you know how how we'd actually like to be um, ac accurate in our value estimates, uh, we we often think about um, you know in, in if if you have a sequential decision making problem, you often care about rare events, right? So events that don't happen quite as often. And so it doesn't quite make sense to then think about states of state action pairs uh, just directly based on how often you visit them, right? Because in fact, like for example, if you think about um, a, like, a, like, like chess, for example, as a goal, where you have, you know, win or lose as your final event, then that event is, you know, quite important, whereas you might actually visit that quite, you know, um, quite rarely. And, and on the other hand, you also spend function approximation resources for learning these average outcomes that you know may not that um, th that may not be as important as these other uh, sort of rare events, right? And sort of a simple example of this, a concrete example would be so um, so suppose you have a driverless car and and you have a policy that you know quite rarely crashes, but you still want to accurately estimate that a particular state has a very low value because you might crash from that state onwards, right? So that's a good reason for you know not waiting according to mu. And I guess yes, again one over s should go from all of these equations. But so essentially what you have in these interest weighted objectives is uh, you, you add this I of S or I of S A, which is essentially um, a positive, or a, a, like a scalar that's either zero or you know, positive, um, which, is, which, which changes your objective, right? How, how, how you weight each state or state action pair. Sorry. Yeah? Uh, you made a um, conclusion, uh, sorry, I did just walk in, that rare events are interesting ones. And I wonder <coughs> why you said that. Because I would think if they're rare and either they're really, really good or really, really bad, those are ones you pay attention to. There's a lot of rare stuff. It matters nothing to your life. So I'm wondering where that conclusion came from. So, so it, it, again, it depends on the problem, yes. But, but in general, we, uh, what we want is we want flexibility to allow for us to care about states in different ways, right? Or state action pairs in different ways. And, and that's kind of where that comes from, right? Um, and so a naive solution would be, so suppose we start from TD and then we just add this interest um, as, as a, uh, to, to basically scale our update, um, but this doesn't quite work. And a simple example is if you use bootstrapping, if you care about, let's say, state A, but you don't care about state B, then if you use bootstrapping because A cares about the value of state B because that's how uh, TD works, it doesn't quite work, right? So you would have to uh, also include interest through this bootstrapping process, right? So you essentially have this intrinsic interest um, that you have over a state or state action pair, and then you have uh, this other interest that comes through bootstrapping, right? Because uh, like a, a previous state or previous state action pair c cares about the current state or state action pair, right? Um, and so, the, so, so we have this emphasis algorithm that essentially answers how we should combine um, the intrinsic interest that we have on a state or state action pair and then the interest through bootstrapping, right? And that brings us to emphatic TD. And so on the left, you have the original TD algorithm, uh, or sorry, t TD lambda algorithm, if M is set to one, and M is what we call the emphasis, um, and on the right, we have b basically the updates that happen to, to, to essentially compute the emphasis, right? And it essentially has two parts. So the follow-on trace, the FT, so uh, the follow-on at time T, 
is essentially keeping track of the uh, accumulated discounted um, important sampling. So if you have off policy learning, the important sampling corrected interest that you have on, on accurately estimating the current state of state action value uh, uh, based on the, the prior state of state action values interest right? Um, and then IT here the, is the intrinsic interest on, on that particular uh, state of state action pair. And so what we're essentially doing when you calculate the emphasis is this linear interpolation between the interest and the follow on trace, right? And so if the, if for example, if lambda is, if you have uh, full bootstrapping, in that case, you would just use your follow on, right? Um, you'd basically do this first part where you have your, you, you'd basically correct your previous follow on and then accumulate the interest. So that's if lambda is zero, right? And otherwise, if lambda is um, one, then what you would do is just use the intrinsic interest on the current state of state action value, right? And I briefly just wanted to mention there's a, there's a lot of related work, um, you know, that's been part of this. And uh, in particular, the one that I think w is kind of um, very nice is the emphatic, uh, this talk by Rupam uh, quite well back, which this uh, has been a lot of, uh, which I've taken inspiration from in this talk. Um, and so, so, so now I'll be moving on to actually the experiments that we do, that, that I did with um, emphatic TD. And so particularly the, uh, the environment is mountain car, I use style coding. And the policy is a, is a greedy policy of an agent trained with Q-learning. Um, and so this is sort of the, the true value uh, function visualization. So I just picked, I, I, so, so in this case, the environment uh, state space is, you have two dimensions, this, uh, position and velocity. And I just went through the position and velocity space and ran the policy to compute the actual value function, right? And it's completely, it's uh, greedy, so it's deterministic, right? And so now I'm going to be talking about the interest functions that I used. And in general, interest functions can be a function of all variables in an update, right? Um, so this is a, the, the, the most general sense, but uh, what I'll be focusing on here is ones based on time, right? Um, so we have start state interest, which is essentially interest on just the first state, and then for all, all the future states, you essentially have zero interest, and uniform interest where you have interest of one for all, all states, right? Yeah? Interest function can be a variables Yeah, so what I mean is that it doesn't have to, for example, just be something that's dependent on, a, uh, like, uh, on, 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 for example, the state. It can be dependent on the time step. It can be dependent on other things, right? And actually, I'll be talking about later, uh, like, a, a, a particular um, interest function that, is, is, uh, that uses the discount factor in lambda, which is actually equivalent to TD. But I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. question. If the agent visits the start state again somewhere through the episode, and its observation is like another, uh, another state, then how can it find that if, if, if it's the start state again, or if it's a non-start state? So, I, so yeah, so in these experiments, the way I handle it is, is, is that the start state only the first time you, like basically when you start is you, you get interest for that and for all future time steps, you get zero interest. But yeah, yeah, you could think about it doing the other way as well, but yeah. Uh, so this is sort of the, uh, for the first case. So I'll be talking about the start state and uniform, uh, start state interest and uniform interest in, in two cases where you have full bootstrapping and without bootstrapping, so no bootstrapping. Um, and so, so this is the, the emphasis is, is the, so in the last row is the, the important row here, but basically what you have is you have interest on just the first state, like I mentioned before, and lambda is zero because you're using full bootstrapping. And what you end up with is essentially that your emphasis is one for, for all time steps, right? If you apply the emphasis algorithm and this is sort of the visualization of the, uh, the actual values. And so you can see that, uh, so, so in blue is the true value. So the, in t the, the, the first plot up is just the interest. So you can see there's a lot of interest for the first state. The emphasis is, you know, like I mentioned, one for all states. And then the, the so this is across episodes, right? So this is episode 10 currently. Um, and this is, so you have the true value in blue and then the predicted values in red, right? Across time steps, right? Um, and then what you see is, you know, as you learn, the, you, you first learn the, the values towards the end of the episode quite well because this is TD, right? So, and you're bootstrapping off those values. And then as you learn, you know, the values for your states towards the beginning of the episode also become quite good. Um, and so, so now I'm going to be talking about such interest without bootstrapping. And in this case, basically what you're doing is sort of a Monte Carlo estimate of just the start state value, right? Because the emphasis is one there. Um, and so interestingly, what you see is basically, you know, what you would kind of expect where you, you essentially learn just the start state value, right? You don't learn about any other states. Um, and sort of, you know, in, in the Monte Carlo sense, that's kind of what you see here. 
Um, and then you have uniform interest with full bootstrapping, so you have interest everywhere for all the states. Uh, full bootstrapping, and this is a particularly interesting case where you get this um, basically increasing linearly emphasis. Um, and that essentially leads to some interesting behavior as well. So what you see is that um, essentially what it, it learns the values for the states uh, towards the end of the episode quite well, but the states at the beginning, as because they have low emphasis, are actually uh, updated, you know, quite small. And then as you learn, those those values will also become better. But you have this uh, interesting behavior where it, you know, it, it keeps the values of the uh, states towards the beginning of the episode close to the initial values for a while. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So time step. So so this is a d deterministic policy from the same start state, right? So I'm just running the same. I'm, I'm just running one episode essentially. Just multiple times, right? Um, yeah. And then finally, you have the uniform interest without bootstrapping. Um, and here too, we get emphasis as one. But the behavior of this algorithm, as you kind of see, is kind of different. And this should look a little bit like. Uh, you know, if, if you think about the behavior of Monte Carlo, which has high variance, then you might see something like, oh, whoops. Yeah, you might see something like this, right? Where, where all state values essentially decrease sort of independently, right? Because there's no bootstrapping involved. And this is sort of the Monte Carlo behavior of the algorithm, right? Um, okay, so, 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 so basically all of these were some visualizations of sort of the emphasis algorithm with different settings of interest and, and, um, and lambda, the bootstrapping parameter. And then we can actually go ahead and compare you know, TD and ETD. And so here I did 30 runs uh, with equal interest on all states. And for each run, I picked uh, basically 100 randomly chosen start states. Um, and then equal interest on all the states that you visit in, in those episodes, right? And this is the plots uh, for that. And we see that ETD you know, does better. Uh, but now I'm going to be talking a bit carefully about you know, how we should be thinking about the relation between TD and ETD. Um, so, so we can think about what is actually the intrinsic interest in TD. So, so while TD doesn't have an interest, we don't actually use interest there. We can think about you know, what is the actual intrinsic interest we, we use because emphasis is always one, right? For all time steps, um, you know, in TD lambda, emphasis is one for all the time steps. So, so, so let's assume a constant um, gamma and lambda, right? As, as, as we do in TD lambda generally. And then we can solve for the interest, right? Um, and that's essentially, you know, I've some math here for this in the next slide. But essentially, what you do is you apply these, you know, these two equations. Um, and and I, I can probably go to the first one. Basically, what you do is, you know, you have MT as uh, the emphasis is one for all time steps. You initialize your follow on as zero, and then basically you can, you know, using this equation because rho is um, one, because you're doing on on policy. In this case, I'm assuming on policy learning. Um, yes. Talking about now, I don't understand what, what are you doing. So what I'm doing is essentially uh, I'm so so assuming the emphasis is one for all time steps, which is what you do in, in t t t which is equivalent to, to basically doing uh, TD lambda, right? So if I go to the previous slide, I think it was this one, right? So basically M is always one in in when we do t t TD lambda, right? So what I'm doing is essentially computing the interest, which would give me emphasis as being one always with with any lambda and gamma. Right. You're turning it around. You're saying I want a certain emphasis. You're yes. What the, I, I, what the interest is? Yes. Well, cool. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So and then basically, yeah. So as, as you as you go through the equations, what you end up with is at least for the first state. Probably go through this a bit quickly. I think I'm running a bit short. Um, yeah, so, so basically what you end up with is actually this. I skipped those slides, but you know, we can talk later. Is you end up with the interest being this particular function and the follow-on being this other function, right? And what this actually says is that uh, TD lambda is equivalent to basically ETD with this particular interest function, right? If you use this interest function, then you basically get, uh, basically if you use this interest function in, in ETD, you get uh, TD lambda, right? Yeah? So, so this would be the interest at a particular time step, right? So this is, um, so what I do here is, sorry? Oh, so, so this is constant lambda and gamma, right? So, so this is the interest across time. 
right? So, so for the first state, you would have interest of 1. For the second, you'd have 1 minus gamma times 1, 1 minus lambda. And for the third, you'd have the three terms and four, four terms and so on. That's the interest function, right? Um, and so what are the implications of this? So as I mentioned, so, so basically, TD lambda is a special case of emphatic TD, where the interest function is defined in this very particular way, right? Um, and so what this says is that in, it's kind of interesting is that the trace decay parameter actually changes your interest function. So, uh, so initially I talked about, uh, uh, if you think about the Sassir interest with full bootstrapping that's equivalent to TD0, and uniform interest without bootstrapping is equal to TD1, right? And then in, in between this, you have essentially this, um, uh, the spectrum, right? And so as I mentioned, so, so when you have TD0, the actual objective that you're sort of minimizing is the start state interest, right? I mean, oh, sorry, the, the start state value error. And then when you use TD1, or you know, uh, it's sort of the Monte Carlo estimate, uh, or, or the Monte Carlo algorithm, you're actually estimating, um, you're actually minimizing the objective that, uh, that has interest uniformly across all your states, right? Okay, so any questions still there? No, uh, probably I'll come back to them. But anyway, so, um, so now I'm going to be talking about some other interesting things about the interest function. So one is that you can, we can think about using that it to control for uh, interference or generalization, right? Um, and essentially here what I'm plotting is the value error. So after, after we train on episode five, so uh, this, this kind of holds across episodes, but this is on, on particular. So um, after training on episode five, like how the value error for your state space changed. Right? So what I'm visualizing here is how the value error, whether it increases or decreases for each state, right? Um, and what you can see is that, on, so on the left, you have uniform interest. Um, and essentially, what, what you want to see is that you don't have as many areas that are red, right? If you have areas that are red, then your value error has increased after training on this particular episode. Uh, again, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. So can you say again? So, so what I'm doing is I'm basically using two different interest functions, right? And I'm... So what I'm what I'm visualizing here is the change in the value error after after a training on a particular episode across two different interest functions. Why? Because what I want to see is 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 if we can actually use the interest function to control how we accurately estimate values across states, right? We want to see that the interest function is actually is actually making the the, the values accurate for the states you're interested in, right? Across your state space, right? And, and how that affects your generalization and interference is kind of what I'm visualizing here. Okay, uh, just a few steps in between there. That I okay, so, so basically, so, so again, this is one episode. So I don't know if you see the dots there. So this is the actual episode. So the episode trajectory goes like this, something like this. And then what I'm plotting here is the, the change in the value error after we've trained on that one episode, right? And what we see is that if you have uniform interest, which basically is, you know, uh, we have interest over more states, that we, uh, we actually get less value error, right, across after, after training on this episode. Whereas if you have started interest, then towards the end, so the episode ends around this area, you actually have more value error, right? So that's a, a good sign that actually using interest, um, you can actually control how much interference or generalization we have, right? That's a good, yeah? This is on mountain car, right? This yes. Okay. Yes, this is on mountain car as well. Um, okay, and this is this is basically another thing interesting that with bootstrapping. So what what you see here is that um, basically, if you look at the scale, so this was ten and that was one, and you know when you don't use bootstrapping, it reduces. Basically, meaning that um, you know we can also use bootstrapping as another way to control for the value error. And this was a question I think at a previous RLAI uh, meeting that we had, which basically the question was whether bootstrapping um, interfere. I mean, uh, the, the amount of bootstrapping changes out the, um, the amount you interfere, right, in your value estimates. That was one question. Okay, and then quickly, I guess, yeah, I'm almost out of time. But so, so quickly, I, I, I'll, I'll talk about the control problem. So in the control problem, we're trying to maximize, um, you know, the, the value of the start state, or basically the, the expected return that we get. Um, and, and essentially, what we, in, in control, it becomes a lot more, um, tr you know, it, it becomes a lot more intricate to think about interest. So first, it's unclear exactly how we should think about how we want our action value estimates to be, you know, accurate. Uh, particularly because if we ex if we have an exploration policy, while we explore, we don't really care about a particular action value estimates because we're not using them, right? Whereas when you exploit, at that point, yes, you, you're going to start beginning to use your 
your action value estimates. So it's intricately related to um, you know, your, your expiration policy. Um, and also, the other interesting thing is, is your, uh, the, uh, often the optimal policy has a state visitation frequency that's quite different from, from let's say, a random policy, right? So we'll have to account for the fact that the state visitation also changes quite a bit um, as, as we think about control. Right? And, and so, so really in control, I think the interest should be something that's non-zero and non-stationary. Um, um, and, and I say non-zero because and any time you visit a state or state, because you, you kind of want to know what action to take, right? So that's why it should be non-zero. Yes? Uh, can you explain why, uh, why you are taking into account the state visitation of the policies? Because so, 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 so let's suppose you want, you want to choose an interest function th 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 that will al allow you to do well, right? Basically to, to accrue a high reward. So what you might want to think about is, 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 you know, for example, in a grid world, so actually the experiment I'm going to be using is a grid world, you might want to set interest for just along the optimal trajectory, right? But that doesn't quite work because initially you need to explore, right? To actually, to, 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 to actually you know, f at the end, figure out that, you know, th that's the optimal path. So in this case, what I'm trying to say is that the state visitation kind of changes. And so we'll have to think about that as we choose our interest functions, right? Um, and yeah, that's Would kind of what I mean. I think you're motivated by saying that uh, those could be kind of, so you could have some certain state distribution, but your interest function could be independent of that based on um, other things, yeah. certain events or something. And so in which case, uh, if I have some idea of what the optimal policy should be, maybe I can have a constant. Yeah, I think what you want to do is kind of move towards the the, the uh, at, like eventually the, the actual uh, you know you, you want to move towards the interest function that that kind of the optimal policy implies right in some sense so you're right but I don't think you can do that initially is what I'm trying to say but yeah anyways so I think I'm running out of time but basically I, I'll, I'll show my results for control and what you see is that for so I, I did emphatic sarsa right so I ran emphatic sarsa which basically um, I changed the um, so, so, in, so previously I was doing emphatic TD, so there we use state value estimates here. I'm using action value estimates. That's basically the main difference. Um, and so what you see is that for, for SARSA, we actually get this slower learning where you, because we have just interest on the start state. Yes? What problem are we talking about? So this is on, on this grid world. So on this grid world, um, I'm, yeah, I'm basically executing under different interest functions. What are the rewards? So the reward is one for each of the goal state and zero otherwise. And, and H, H means the episode terminates and you basically end the episode wi without occurring any reward. So the H, H just refers to holes here in this, in this episode. So it's just to complete the full picture of how this environment looks. And, and so what we see here is essentially that we get, we get you know, I've I tried a bunch of different interest functions. Um, there's some interesting ones. So one I maybe can mention is the minimum action gap. So here I define action gap as the max Q minus the, the min Q, so, so Q here is the action value at, at a particular state. So what you want to do is essentially maximize, um, so, so, so what you want to do is, is basically if, if a particular state has a very low action gap, meaning that, you, 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 that all actions have about the same value, then what you want to do is actually make your updates bigger, right? You want to scale your updates so that the bigger, so that you increase your action gap. And then, then, then you have this bigger um, action gap at that particular state, right? Um, and so yeah, so I tried a bunch of different ones, and what you, and basically what in control, what I see is that you know that, that you're able to get faster performance, um, and and ab about the same asymptotic performance um, w with with other interest functions apart from from just the start state interest, which is what is equivalent to SARSA zero. Right. Um, yeah. Anything else that I miss here? Yeah, that's about it. Any questions? Okay, yeah, so, so there's some future work, but yeah, probably get to questions. Again, like naive perspective, having not studied 
much of mountain car, is why are there so many high frequency components in this plot, like blocks I'm and dots and little bits? I'm not too sure. I mean, it seems so. So I use so again. This is the visualization in the t two dimensional state space. I'm using again tile coding. So I don't know if that has anything to do with this particular visualization and if that causes any of these high frequency sort of you know. What's the policy that you're following for this? Oh, for this I'm just using. So I, I trained a policy with Q learning with linear function approximation with tile coding, and th and this is just the greedy policy I, I get from from the the trained agent. So after how many episodes did you plot, did you make this plot? Um, basically, what, what once it converged to, yeah, about um, minus 110, I think it solved that, right, around minus 110, yeah, average reward, yeah. Um, how did you initialize the value functions? Uh, you the plots for Yes, so I initialized the value functions basically uniformly random around zero, which, which, is, which is kind of why you see that, you know, when you start them, they're all around zero, like initially, right? All the values are around zero. Whoops. Yeah. yeah? Can you go back to the plot uh, for the TV and UTV? Yes. Yeah. So for this one, do you use the same alpha and uh, the gamma for both? So, so normally what you do with, so, so the emphasis here, so I'm using the, uh, for, for ETD, I'm using a uniform interest, right? So this is all uniform interest. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so when you use uniform interest, you get linearly increasing emphasis. So what you have to do is basically normalize your emphasis to, to basically get, um, you know, and, and, and then what you can do is, so in this case, I, I am using the same step size. Yes. So to answer your question, yes, I am using the same step size. Yeah. Yes. I'm using the same step size with normalized emphasis. So, so the emphasis, because you know, it linearly increases like that. So what I do is I normalize it so that the max emphasis is one. Uh, yeah? And what domain was where these set of results? Oh, so, so all of this is mountain card up to control. OK, uh, so. Up to the control part. So uh, what is the? So is this for a particular state, the start state, or something? Which which particular plot? Um, all of it, I guess. Like so. So so so, so, like so all of yeah. So all of these are basically just so 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 th these four four plots, the ones that have the time step one. Yeah. They are all basically one episode. So I just keep running from the same start state, and then I'm just plotting b because you know. I, so 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 I don't have this other component of stochasticity or other such yeah, states and things like that. In Monte Carlo, don't you like go back and then generally go up? Yes. So then, shouldn't the true value be kind of like decrease initially and then increase? No. So so this is a greedy policy, right? So so basically, what's happening is I'm executing just um, from one start state, right? And, and so, so what you want to see is basically that for, for each state, it's basically, so, so in this case, I'm using gamma as one, right? So for the last state, you essentially have zero value because that's, you get zero. And then for the previous state, you get just minus one and so on, right? So, so, so basically at the beginning of the episode, you get minus 200. So, so in, in this particular episode, it got 200 reward, minus 200, right? Yeah. Everyone understood everything? Yeah. I just have one further question about the that 2D plot where you're showing the the thing where I asked about the high frequency yeah, ones, the space space. You can listen. In the you're in the <coughs> subsequent that plots that were on the same axis that, that like showed the blue to red scale. Yeah. That's the you can listen. Oh wait for you to rise. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I want to make sure I'm understanding what's being spotted here. Is this a difference between what you've trained and that sort of like known true value? Yes. So, so, so here, what I'm plotting is is the change in the value error, right? So, so at at episode, at, so so basically, at before episode five, you you had some value error, right? 
And what I'm plotting is after, the, after you've trained on that episode, how much the value error has changed, right? So how much the value error has changed after training on that one episode right? so across the state space. So this plot is in no way dependent upon that previous one. So it, it's dependent because when you compute the value error, you, you, you need the true values, right? And the true values come from that plot. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's just surprising to see a lack of those high frequency components in this version where you're taking a difference from it. Yeah, I, I guess the other thing is I should say, so, so all of these are actually uh, with, so this is, these are not linear. These are actually using the neural network. So, so, so on, on these two plots, right, the, this one and the following one, I'm actually using a neural network. Um, and showing essentially how, how the interference happens when, when we use, n you know. Uh, so in, in the previous experiments, they were all with linear function approximation. This is with nonlinear function approximation. Uh, yeah? This, uh, this one, like the previous plot was about generalization interference. So yes. would you expect this to not happen, for example, like in a tabular environment? Yes. So, so this is basically about um, how setting interest can control for how much you, you interfere with other states, right? So, so what I'm saying is if, if you have higher interest, so, so again, so I don't know if you see those dots, but the episode went something like this, right? And so if you have uniform interest, then you basically ha don't have high value error. But if you, if you have just sad state interest, which is somewhere here, I think the dot is here, then towards the end of the episode, you have this high value error. And so how interest can control for how much you interfere with other states and things like that. Yes, it, it, it probably is, you know, something simple like that. But what I'm saying is essentially that interest can control for, um, you know, all of this, right? And so, so yes, I mean, but, but um, it, it, it is because you have higher emphasis, but you can also think of other cases where, for example, your emphasis drops to zero because, you, you, you know, there's a particular state you don't care about, and then you care about another state. So you can actually finally control how much you care about um, value error. And, and also because of bootstrapping, yes. So their updates are like have higher emphasis. So yes. like regardless of having a function approximator or not, then you would have like higher emphasis on those updates on the wages. That yeah, so so that is I mean, but so I guess I mean well, what this is saying is so so actually what is interesting is is you see that you have low error across along the episode. So here it's kind of blue, right? But but around the neighboring area you actually have red. So what's interesting is that along the episode, because you actually are doing updates here, if, if, you, if you include interest, you, you know, you, that, that basically goes away. The interference aspect goes away, which is kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, just, just for the, to the high frequency plot, uh, so how did you plot, uh, how did you calculate the true value? So, so I, I basically, I, uh, so basically what I did is I, I so I, I, I so I, I picked, I think, uniformly across the state space, like all the points, and then just ran the policy from that, that point. Right? So I initialized, I would initialize the start state. How did you know that's the optimal policy? So no, so, so this is prediction, right? This is not an optimal policy. This is a particular policy's true value. So that's, that's, true value that's true value or predicted value? So this is, so, so, so this is the true value of, of the policy trained with Q-learning, right? So I train a policy with Q-learning, I'm running the greedy policy, and I'm looking at the so true value for that state. Is by, uh, and just points yes, yeah, exactly. And by a fixed yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just a question about your mapping implementation. How do you initialize each episode? Do you start randomly across the state space, or just randomly near the bit bottom, bottom of the valley? So this depends, right? So, so, so for, so yeah, so this depends. So, so for all, all, all of these experiments, for these, the, the, like the, for these four plots, I just use the same start state, right? But then for the other ones, for example, like I mentioned in this, in this one, uh, in this one, I'm taking 100 randomly chosen start states across the entire state space. Uh, 